so now we're going to, I'm going to introduce Vivian to everyone, I guess that everyone pretty much knows her. So such, um, we're very thrilled to have her as she's the person, one of the co-founder of the entire field and scholarship of network learning that we're all having a special feeling towards. Um, so, and then she's, she has been a co-organizer of biannual conference on the network learning research at the same time she's co-edited this volume and um, Springer book series researching network learning that uh, one of the um, reading that we have done is included in that. So it's great to have her here today, particularly uh, I'm very grateful that she accepted this invitation that she just retired unfortunately or fortunately um, this past summer. So it's great for her to willing to come and talk to us as you can see that a lot of students here are willing to uh, are very interested in the scholarship. So that's really good. And also, I should just say personally, it would be I'll be thrilled and very uh, proud of myself if I were in the position as you are vivid, uh, Vivian, <laughs> at the end of my academic career, if I can have the name theory that everyone will think about that's Camille who invented. So I'm um, anyway, by that little comment, I'm happy to uh, for you to come in and share your screen and have a little conversation with us, please. Okay, I think uh, you're a bit too kind. <laughs> um, but it's, it's lovely to have the opportunity actually to speak to this particular group, because of course, um, your program is based and was designed as a network learning program. Um, and that makes it um, both very relevant to your own understanding of the underlying principles of the program, but also it would appear to quite a lot of your research. So um, what I thought I would do um, is spend a few minutes talking a bit about the chapter. Um, which is, which is actually in the very first book um, that Springer asked us to write based on the network learning conferences. And interestingly, the first chapter does give a lot of the background to the history as we perceive it of network learning, which is totally embedded and emerged from my perspective from Lancaster, um, partly from educational research clearly um, at the time when Peter Goodyear was there as well as um, when David McConnell and myself were at the time in the management school, I was the only one that stayed. Everybody else is now in Australasia, i.e. Um, Peter, as you will all know, is in Sydney. And um, David recently retired to New Zealand. And I retired this summer. So, <clears throat> The chapter is um, the final chapter of that particular book, which was based on chapters of papers that were actually presented at the 2010 Network Learning Conference in Aalborg. So in a sense, it's um, 10 years since it emerged as a piece of research and thinking. Um, and we set out in the chapter to do various things, um, partly to summarize what the um, various chapters in the, excuse me, in the book from the original conference were saying, but also, as we point out on page 291, uh, to answer what we thought were four important questions. Uh, which was, is network learning a theory, practice, or a pedagogy? What are the pedagogical values that underpin network learning? What is the relevance and challenges of network learning to mainstream higher education? And what new possibilities and challenges is Web2 bringing to network learning? Basically, by that, we meant the whole development of social networking, which was kind of in its infancy when we wrote the chapter. And looking at those questions, um, 
and one thing that I'd be interested to hear more from yourselves is 10 years on, do you still think these are important questions or do they need to be revised, changed, um, no longer relevant? Interestingly, in, at the end of the chapter, we, write, we wrote on page 304, and I think this is quite interesting. We believe that in a global economy that is based on information and social networks, a transformation of mainstream higher education is needed. Our view is the theory, practice and pedagogy of network learning can contribute to this transformation. So we were writing that 10 years ago, and ironically, it's only now with the sudden, as some people describe it, pivot to online learning as a result of the pandemic, that it's really having any potential impact on mainstream higher education to the extent that we were suggesting it. So whilst there's always been programmes like your own, which are very much based on network learning, it's hardly been mainstream. But it, in preparing to talk to you, I thought we could almost be writing now. We believe that during the global pandemic and the accompanying rapid move to online learning in mainstream higher education, we should, in our view, consider the contribution of theory, practice and pedagogy of network that network learning can make. Because people, I don't know how it is in those of you who are in various institutions, but certainly in the management school, a lot of um, switching to the on, and not all by any means, but a lot of the switching to online learning is just doing what you've always done, but putting it into video. Excuse me, my voice is going completely. And actually, we've, had, we've written a paper, which some of you may have read, which was published in um, um, Post-Digital Science and Education, which um, is looking at how this change is happening. And what we could be thinking about from a network learning perspective, because should network learning almost, as we say in the chapter, be the pedagogy of choice in a global, global pandemic? So in the paper that we wrote for Post Digital, we go back to the original definition. And those of you who have been to network learning conferences will know <coughs> that is something that we regularly go back to. Does the definition of network learning as um, written actually in 1998-99 for a project that was run from educational research um, where we said we define network learning as learning in which information and communications technology, ICT, is used to promote connections between one learner and another learner, between learners and tutors, and between the learning community, community and its learning resources. And in the post-digital science and education paper, we point out, which has often been pointed out to be, off, to be honest, um, that in that definition, it's very silent about the connections, um, what the connections are for. Um, it's silent about the activity and purpose of network learning. And actually, and this is where we come to the chapter, it's quite silent about what we mean by learning. Uh, and it was written for the project that we were um, applying for, which was a GISC project. And it was therefore much more focused around the technology. And it was about understanding network learning in higher education. So it was a definition of its time, but we, as much as anybody, have been part of the process of of perpetuating 
and that definition uh, continuing to be the main thing we refer to. But as I say, it didn't really refer to learning. And one of the things that we were trying to do in this chapter um, was look closer at what was and what is the underlying pedagogical values that underpin network learning, which are not actually articulated in the definition. And um, it, write what they are and illustrate them through chapters in the book. Um, in the paper, uh, we simply say that network learning is a field of research and practice in education. Whereas in this chapter, we make a much bolder claim, uh, which people might want to challenge, I might even challenge it myself, to be honest, is that network learning is a theory, a practice and a pedagogy. Um, but I think at the very least, whatever you think it is, it occupies a certain pedagogical space and identity in a post-digital world, and one that is underpinned by certain um, and identifiable pedagogical values and ideas. And that is what we were trying to um, explain in the chapter, basically. And we defended um, the idea that it was a theory, practice and pedagogy, basically by saying that um, it's um, the divide and the separation of theory and practice is claimed by a number of social sciences to be an artificial one. And what is more, um, that we perceive practice as a proxy, proxy for epistem epistemology. And so taking that stance, we felt that it moved us closest to, closer to overcoming the issue of separating theory from practice. And then, and I'll briefly go through this, because I don't want to talk for that long. I just want to locate what we were trying to do in the paper and then see what your own views about that are. And as I say, how relevant you still think the questions and the ideas that we explored in the chapter um, are, particularly at this time when everything has become so much more, um, not so much mainstream, but certainly moving to online is definitely what whole, all higher education institutions are tending to do. Um, so we then briefly described what we thought the ontological position of network learning is. Um, and that is one that assumes um, an understanding of the world and view of the world, including learning and teaching, is socially, culturally influenced and constructed. And we, said, and we claim and believe, and this was important at the beginning for us, that it aligns itself with the critical and humanistic traditions of education. So very much critical pedagogy and more emancipatory, radical, humanistic traditions. So that is where network learning potentially was different to what other things were happening at that time, which was about the potential of technology to change things. Whereas we're saying it enabled and helped us to achieve some of the pedagogical values and the epistemology that we were already trying for were important and had a long tradition. So the epistemology of network learning is in essence that knowledge emerges or is constructed in relational dialogue or collaborative interaction. In other words, knowledge is not a property, but a social out there, uh, but is socially constructed and is a way of knowing and experiencing the world. And um, we went on to say that the impact of the influence of that on the pedagogy of network learning, as I explained in Ryberg, Booth and Gerson's chapter, is that important principles are equality, inclusion, critical reflexivity, and relational dialogue. And to have those sort of as important values and principles, um, the pedagogical and social technical design of network learning requires giving attention to issues of power, voice, issues, access, and inclusion 
type issues. Um, so we also said in the chapter a few additional characteristics and principles for learning and assessment and teaching that we thought were important. Um, and these were basically cooperation and collaboration in the learning process, uh, working in groups and communities, especially learning communities were important to us. These were outlined on page 295. Discussion and dialogue, self-determination in the learning process, difference and its place as a central learning place uh, process, i.e. addressing issues of difference within a particular learning community, trust and relationships, uh, taking time to build trust and relationships, uh, develop weak and strong ties, reflexivity and investment in the self in the net is important in the network learning process and the role that technology plays in connecting and mediating. So we, we basically go on in the chapter to, to discuss all of these ideas and to illustrate them with um, examples from, chapter, from the chapters in the book of the papers that were presented in 2010. And some additional aspects that we discuss are things like uh, the very important one, assessment, um, the role of the facilitator or animator, as we sometimes prefer to refer to them, and the role and the material effect of technology and, as I said, new social media. We also say um, that all of this means that network learning, whilst invariably associated with learning design spaces or situations that are based on collaborative and participative learning approaches that are inquiry or action led, such as those associated with action learning or problem and project based learning or action research. There isn't one taken for granted way of doing, for want of a better word, network learning. Um, it takes a particular pedagogical and uh, value position, um, which is around knowledge as relational and dialogical. And it is also concerned with the nature of the meaning and understanding of knowledge of the world that is constructed and how this contributes to the well being of society and the world in which we live. So we explicitly state that as well. And I think what I'd like to do, if um, that's okay, because I think um, it's about time. I should have done, that the people had a chance to speak, is just briefly summarise um, some of what I find important in the chapter. And I'm sure there are other things that other people will find more or less important um, by showing you a few, very only four slides, which I think help for me to um, articulate in a different way what I think the chapter was about. So I'll just do that and then um, I'll leave it open and notice that um, there's quite a few things in the chat session, but I don't know that. I wasn't following that because I was actually reading from notes, not reading from notes, looking at notes. <laughs> um, so I'll share my screen, which is, uh, there you go. So, um, yeah, this is um, basically, you're saying who I am, obviously, and where I'm at, but also the um, first image is, um, reflects for me that network learning is very difficult to pin down. And, I, and as I say, there isn't one way of doing it, and there isn't, this is network learning, but it does have and is associated with in traditionally and long established um, ideas of pedagogy from Paula Freire type critical uh, pedagogy through to uh, more recent um, Carl Rogers humanistic emancipatory ideas and uh, Henry Giroux 
but that in I itself is is it? no. Um, but those in themselves are not without critical um, insights and um, positions. So particularly in the early 90s, there was some very nice work done by people like Jennifer Gore and Elizabeth Ellsworth. And I think Elizabeth Ellsworth's um, title just captures one of the real sort of things um, that you could say about critical pedagogy and these inquiry-led methods. How transferable are they across cultures and nations almost? Um, because it's very much a Western and humanistically developed idea. And Elizabeth Ellsworth working in America, in the US was with students um, from non-traditional backgrounds um, was writing about why doesn't this feel empowering and working through the repressive myths of critical pedagogy. So I think there is another side to, to all of this, clearly. Um, and also I like, um, I very much like the idea of uh, Foucault on heterotopia. Um, this is an image that, which is on the introduction to the um, talk today, uh, which uh, a colleague of mine who used to work at Lancaster and is now an artist, um, retired quite a long time ago, but very much carries on her artist. Um, we actually, it was interesting that the TEL programme is now in its 25th year. We had a programme which has now finished. I hope it doesn't happen to the TEL programme. Um, and it had a 30th anniversary and it was the MA in Management, Learning and Leadership. And um, we had a celebration of the 30 years and Morgan, who did these paintings, did some paintings. She's a conceptual artist to try and capture some of the concepts we were working with um, on Mammal, but within my own writing on network learning. So we did a presentation together where she'd done some paintings and I talked about important concepts to me of network learning. And this one of heterotopia, she captures the idea that education is generally a bounded experience, including within network learning, actually, because there is a certain uh, norms and expectations of how, a, how to be a learner, um, what is required, what is expected. So most education is quite bounded. So that's what she was trying to demonstrate in these rounds. Whereas heterotopia, as um, described by uh, um, Foucault, is um, it's an idea of other spaces that are more transient and temporary um, to those of everyday social spaces and institutions, education being an institution, social institution. And um, this drawing in the top right hand corner uh, shows that more transient and temporary nature where Foucault claims you can, there is space to imagine things differently and act differently. So I don't know why I'm talking at length about this but because it, network learning doesn't always do that. But the idea of heterotopia, an alternative space, I think is quite an interesting one. So if I just go on to the next slide, which doesn't seem to want to happen. Yeah, um, two of the key concepts or principles that I talked about um, coming out of a humanistic and critical pedagogy um, and social constructionist value base is the idea of self-development, reflexivity and social construction of identity. Um, and so the picture on the left was her take on this notion of social development and one that initially started off as a very individualistic, how do I become a better, more in, a reflective person through to it now being a much fuzzier concept and one that is um, much more performative, if you will, um, and doesn't stand there just as a body out there, but as part of a whole social material situation, cultural, political context. 
And the other one, which is the one on the right, is if we're looking at the social notions of social construction of identity, of course, we're much more aware and particularly in a global program like the one that you're involved in, uh, people are in very many different locations. Their identity is, in is being formed situationally, culturally, and as a learner within this program. So these were these swirling masses of which identity are we talking about? Who are we? And what is the learning community? And finally, just to finish, we wondered, and this is a question to yourselves, because we've actually invited other people to take up this question. In the um, paper that we have written as a collective in the Post-Digital Science and Education um, Journal, we've rewritten, if you will, the definition of network learning in an attempt to try and capture some of these uh, more um, pedagogical and um, intentional ideas of network learning. What was its purpose? What is it trying to achieve as a pedagogical approach? And this is what we've come up with as a network learning editorial collective. I'll leave you to read that for a second and then um, as I invite and hope for your views and ideas about the relevance of the questions that we started with, the significance of the kind of points we were making in the chapter 10 years on and your views about this um, network learning definition that we now have. I can quickly read through it and then I'll stop. Network learning involves processes of collaborative and collective inquiry, knowledge building and action underpinned by trusting relationships, motivated by a sense of shared challenge and enabled by convivial technologies. Network learning promotes connections between people, between sites of learning and action, between ideas and solutions across time and space. And stop sharing. Thank Over you very to you. much. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, uh, so it was very <laughs> thought provoking. I know, I'm pretty sure that we do have a lot of questions and some thoughts coming from um, our audience. So I just will open up the floor. So there is nothing. Um, so any thoughts, any uh, reactions that you have currently in your hand, you can just share. It doesn't have to be a well-organized form of questions at all. Um, if you want to um, turn on your camera or microphone and then ask questions, that will be great. If you feel like a little bit uncomfortable to be shown again on the video, what we can do is you can type it. I'm, I can read the question on behalf of you. Um, so I just want to see if we want to change the gallery view. Um, so if you want to raise your hand using the feature, so there is reaction feature, which doesn't have question. So if you want to raise your hand to, oh, so yeah, that's done. Is it well done sign or is it a question? I, yeah, I thought we have a question here, but apparently we don't. So I guess that you have some comment to bring up, right? To the Yeah, 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 I do, if that's okay, Kyung me and everyone. Um I, I'm happy to sort of kick things off. Um and um I'm not sure that my 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 thoughts will be entirely coherent, Vivian, but um I'll I'll try <laughs> and, <laughs> I'll I'll try and get them assembled as, as much as I can. Um, I, I, it's what I'd like to do is sort of comment really on 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 your new sort of definition on this up, up revised definition. Um, I was particularly interested in what you say in there about this sense of shared challenge, because I think in a way 
network learning can lead to a sense of shared challenge rather than coming from a sense of shared challenge. That, that, that seems to me to be something that's inherent within network learning, that you don't always know um, mm. where you're starting or where you're going or actually where you're going to end up, that actually it, it, it opens up whole fields of opportunity which, which can go in all sorts of different ways. And I think that that's a strength of yeah. the thinking about network learning. And I think therefore this, this idea of the sense of shared challenge might, for me, might be a bit sort of misleading in that it might give this sort of idea that you start off mm -hmm. with a commonality. And actually often you don't start off with a commonality mm -hmm. at all, I think. What you do is you develop an understanding you develop a communication, a conversation, and you try to see how you can move forward with it. And what it reminded me of is something is, is a theory. Well, I wouldn't call it a theory, but it has been called a theory, which has emerged since network learning was put forward, which is the idea of connectivism, mm. you know, from, from Siemens and Downs. I mean, any, any of you, uh, any of you who, who know me on this topic will know that I have, you know, um, thoughts of my own about connectivism and, and my own critique on it. Um, but one of the things that, that, that it seems to me that, that, that is coming out of that is this idea almost of a distributed cognition. Now, I've always felt that within network learning, you've never actually gone that far, that, that actually this concept of, of distributed um, cognition is, is, is something that could be potential, but actually you've never explored that within the network learning arena. And I wondered to what extent you saw that as being relevant now, or whether you feel that that's taken a step forward or whether you feel connectivism doesn't relate to network learning. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that. Well, there's quite a lot there, Don. Um... <laughs> To start off, I agree entirely with your point about the challenge. I think um, the idea, if it uh, gives the sense that there is, you start with a sh shared challenge, is probably uh, misleading because I think um, it emerges what people find important to um, consider and review emerges out of relational dialogue and um, being together as a learning community. Although they may start um, with some ideas of why you want to be part of a learning community, but it is, I would agree, it's emergent and um, organic. And that is in a sense part of what I think um, network learning, the kind of space it does occupy. And I'm not sure I see it as being so similar to connectivism, um, mainly because, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see connected, connectivism starting from a base of clear pedagogical values and beliefs, whereas certainly for us, um, that's where network learning starts. Now, not everybody who adopts network learning or writes about network learning necessarily align themselves with those pedagogical beliefs and um, values, but certainly from my perspective, we definitely do. Um, and as for distributed cognition, that's a bit cognitive for me. Thank you. <laughs> you muted, Don. <laughs> I love the last comment. <laughs> All right. I think um, we have. Um, another question. However, Mike, um, so you just made some comment there. I think it's probably related to the current discussion. So you want to come in to make your comment more invulnerable? Um, uh, yeah, well, when Don started talking there, I think there's, there's, there's sort of, um, I'm going to be incoherent now um, as well, uh, but if he can, so can I. Um, so it seems to me that there's something tremendously important in learning, um, in, in being allowed to have space to think in an almost like a non-goal directed way. 
Um, so uh, I think it's Aristotle. I've been reading John Nixon on Gadamer, and um, he makes he takes us back to Aristotle and, and says that it's tremendously important uh, for uh, a nice broad horizon of, of of thinking to be able to disconnect from a kind of goal. Like you know, let's say an engineer wants to build a bridge. Um, but maybe we don't actually know what we want to build. And uh, maybe that's important, um, particularly for some of the hard questions that we are seeking to answer. And, and that, so I think um, that's, that's, that's it really. I just think you know, we need to make space for deliberation um, and, and we need to fight for that. And, and Viv said something about, I don't know if this is still relevant and things like that. The trouble is these are all contested areas, right? Mm -hmm. And unless we continue to fight for these sorts of things, um, then somebody else will take them out of our hands. And, you know, we, I think we've seen that, you know, somebody's kindly said about the flip to online learning um, that, uh, you know, it's probably just done in a panic. Uh, I think it was Deb mentioned that in the chat. Actually, yeah, I don't know how much panic's involved, apart from just saying you know, we can just lay the blame at neoliberalism, right? Because, uh, you know, basically people are just seeing this as an opportunity to grab whole chunks of curriculum and say, oh, we can do it this way. And, you know, we can just roll in the money and give everybody else the P45s. And certain certain courses arguably can deliver in that way. But, uh, yeah, so I think we should be contesting this. And as for connectivism, um, less said the better, I think. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Vivian, do you have any comment? Um, well, I agree with everything Mike said, of course, um, but um, one thing I would say is um, one of the um, principles of learning that I find quite problematic is that of scaffolding, and it's almost in the, con in the context of um, what Mike was saying, scaffolding assumes that there is something that you have to learn, and it, it's a... It's, it's part of a set curriculum, whereas the kind of programs I've been involved in, it isn't pre-described what you're going to learn, but it is within a field. So in my case, it was within the field of management learning. And at the end of two years on a part-time program, as in the case with the end of many more years on a part-time PhD <laughs> doctoral program, you end up with a very widespread of learning, but you didn't know what that learning was going to be. And it wasn't laid out in a set of um, outcomes, learning outcomes. So a lot of the um, regulation and bureaucracy of um, curriculum design has become quite problematic from a learning perspective. Thank you, uh, Vivian and Mike um, and Don. Um, we can move on to probably, so now we kind of talk about the goal maybe not fixed, but probably the way that relationship, the quality relationship, mm. probably trusting relationship, you had a phase, uh, uh, phrase in your new definition, yeah. then maybe the yeah. focus that we can move on. So Oma has uh, asked excellent question there. Oma, do you want to come in and ask question by yourself? I can't see Oma. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Can yes, my question, question is, uh, the paper says that quality of people's relations is an important characteristic in an yeah. online community. So my question is, what's the meaning of um, quality of relations? Mm -hmm. What's a quality relation? Is there a poor quality? Is there a good quality? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it's like a lot of the other stuff in network learning, we haven't articulated it fully. But um, for me, it's not so much the quality of the relationship, but attending to the nature of relationships and being mindful of voice and presence, inclusion and exclusion, and not only being mindful of that, but actually addressing those issues and being explicit and reflective about them. And that gives the relationships an underpinning qualitative process, which contributes to the learning of the learning community. 
Does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, I mean, so probably related question. I do want to say something about Vivian, the poor quality relationship then. What can be poor possibly in network learning? You do get poor quality relationships. I mean, um, we once did a, a study of um, emotions in online learning and used as an example how one person, and this happens a lot in the learning community, um, was being either not listened to or if they spoke, not um, responded to or if they weren't present, were being um, assumed not to be engaged. And that happens a lot. I mean, presence, particularly in a network learning or an online environment, if you're not there, there's a lot of assumptions are made about why you're not there. Um, so the relationship can become much weaker than what is assumed by a lot of the learning community. And we actually quite upset the rest of the community by pointing this out because they felt they were very caring and had done everything that they should to assist this particular person. Whereas actually they were having a total meltdown and crisis, um, which often happens of course for lots of people. Thank you, Vivian. Um and Omar for the question too. I think Mac on chat has some, it's like, it's like kind of, yeah, mixture of comment and question too, to probably yeah. the group. So Mac, do you want to come in and ask your question for us, please? Sorry, infrastructure. Okay. Um, so th th actually, I think in the middle of my my drafting that question, you addressed yeah. you addressed it a little bit. Um, but I I really like the the new definition of network learning um, because it definitely it seems to expand and, and give more shape to yeah. um, the original one. Um, but and it and it it's it just seems it seems. Um, it's very aspirational and, and definitely it's something that I as a, as a teacher would want to work towards. Um, I just know, I'm just thinking about my sort of personal experiences of, of running online teaching sessions um, and trying to build community that, that it's, it's really not straightforward at all um, mm -hmm. and it's never the same each time I, I, I do it um, even, and even though I, I it's clearly fundamental to a successful session and, and learning. Um, and so I guess I was just wondering why, given the roots in critical pedagogy um, that are so laudable about network learning and think and why I think I come back to it again and again um, as being just incredibly compelling, why there just wasn't just that little extra sort of edge of criticality in the actual definition of it. So we talk about there needing to be underpinned by trusting relationships, for example, but we don't really discuss that, um, you know, the, the challenges really in, in making those. And, mm -hmm. and you, you just said that, you know, as, a, as network learning teachers, there should be an effort to, um, you know, always have that sort of reflexivity as an educator. Um, and I was just wondering just why there wasn't, I don't know, I think it just, yeah. I think it just seems sort of, um, I don't know, that it, it could it could just nail down a little bit better what <laughs> we're trying to aspire to. Well, we are, um, I mean, this is really good and important stuff. We are inviting people to write 500 responses, uh, 500 word responses to the definition to point these kind of things out. I think um, definitions are problematic because um, they can't cover every aspect and they, and they can't, as we try to do in the chapter, go into the whole ontology, epistemology and practice and pedagogy and values of network learning. So in a sense, that definition is just trying to capture some across a number of people's view of what is network learning. Now, if I was to write it on my own, I might write it differently. If um, Thomas or Peter 
or Martin or um, Nina, who were all involved in writing that definition were to write it on their own. I'm sure they would all write it differently. So it's always a bit of a compromise, I think, in that sense. But I think you're pointing out, I mean, um, Don's point about the challenges, your point about um, some of the more criticality aspect, if we could capture some of that and develop it further, I think that would be really good. So I really would encourage people to put in some responses to this paper, to the um, call for responses, because it is not, it's not one person's definition, that's the whole point. So the more people who contribute to it, um, maybe the better it'll work. Thank you. After the session, we'll circulate that call. So everyone yeah, here, please. And then the member in the community will see that and contribute to it. Um, so we have a small comment from Debbie. So Debbie, I know that you're kind of trying to pull things for your dissertation topic. So do you want to come in and share your thought and probably get some feedback from people or insight from people? Are you there? Oh. Hi, everyone. Hi, is that working OK? Sorry, I keep having to switch from one screen to another. <laughs> um, really, really interesting. Um, and I, you know, I, I was kind of struck by some of the comments, particularly and that uh, that Mike made as well around um, um, and somebody else made in the chat about the emergency remote education type sort of discourse that's going on at the moment. Um, and I'm kind of looking at that and trying to see whether or not I can frame my study in the kind of context of COVID at the moment and looking at how um, educators can gain emotional support through their own networks and communities. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at this then thinking, I wonder if I can pull that in, in terms of the framework um, to see whether or not that would give me a bit more structure in my, um, in my proposal. Um, so I was just interested to know, you know, the, um, you've asked for these responses. Have you, have you got a deadline for that as well? Uh, yeah, there is, I think it's January. It's January, right? Yeah. Okay. It's um. I should be... know, but <laughs> I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> I'm sure um, somebody will look it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just. Um, that was all. I was just making a comment. Really, I didn't have any specific questions, as it as it were, at the moment. I think um, um, going back to both what Meg was saying and what you you were saying, that two things um, I think are important. One. Network learning as a as an approach and an idea was developed within the context of traditional universities, mm. um, which makes it quite different. I mean, it's so we've worked. I mean, I've worked for the last three or four years with um, staff in Man in um, the L Lancaster Management School uh, in a project that we've called Lumsnet because LUMS is Lancaster University Management School and Net for Network Learning. They gave them gave it the title, not me. Um, and one of the things, uh, we're writing a paper on this at the minute, actually. One of the things that um, was very transparent at the beginning is with, unlike yourselves, I mean, you all come from educational research backgrounds. These were management researchers from different disciplines within the management school who are, care about their pedagogy, but they haven't done research and thinking from um, moving their work to online. Quite the reverse, they're quite, and until uh, March, they would have said they prefer not to do it. But, <laughs> but the thing is that they start with this idea that it's got to be ultra professional, uh, lots of very well um, developed videos and um, professional actors and because they've looked at the open university kind of stuff they think that is and our MOOCs I mean MOOCs have been developed with a lot of resources whereas network learning it's never been developed for its glitz and glamour is what one of my co-authors are calling it it's been developed for its educational and pedagogical using um, robust technologies that are available. We're not interested in trying to use fancy technology. 
um, to do things that actually is difficult for the majority of staff to learn, to know mm -hmm. how to use well, particularly if you're not doing a PhD or in education research and these things. Your everyday lecturer, and we actually called it your everyday lecturer, just wants to help to do it yeah. um, and to do it in a way that isn't complicated, but yeah. actually is pedagogically um, good and effective. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for your comment, De uh, Debbie and Vivian. Um, I we do. I mean, I knew somebody we... would ask about convivial technologies. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. To... Okay, we have a question from Brett, but I think we can. You can wait a little bit because Daniel's yeah. question really well linked to the conversation. I'm going to move to Daniel first. Daniel, do you want to come on? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so it's a really interesting phrase, convivial technologies, and. You know, does that refer to the technologies that refer to how they're, they're used? I, I guess what's in my mind is thinking about, you mentioned social media was kind of starting when you first formulated Deficit 2010. And, you know, obviously there's been, you know, tons and tons of debate ever since about, particularly like Twitter and Facebook, are they by design, do they kind of amplify extremist views? And, you know, is, is it a question of how the technologies are designed or is it just a question of how they use? So I'd just be very interested in your thoughts on, you know what's behind that that phrase and how you'd how you'd see how you see it well first of all i didn't introduce it but <laughs> what is interesting it comes from illich uh work on convivial technologies so it's not a recent phrase and it was certainly before the internet and um social media uh, but of course um, illich was um, interested in the whole idea of webs and webs of learning and how a convivial technology can facilitate and um, assist that. I'm sure Mike might have some comments on this because he uh, has questioned it already uh, as something that um, could it have been put differently. And Peter has actually written a nice note, of, who did introduce it, Peter Goodyear, has actually written a very nice note about um to explain um and it's on his blog site um to explain it more um, it, but it's not to do with um social media or new media it's actually to do with the idea of um, conviviality in terms of the relationship between technology uh, learners and society thanks Mike, I think you're drawn into the conversation by Vivian. <laughs> walk in and give us kind of brief comment that you had from. Um, so, very as brief as I can make it. Um, so, the point I made on Twitter was about congenial, and that that almost could uh, be a good word because it has its own uh, phrasing as well. But you know, I'd, I wouldn't want to clutter things up by just checking words around in that way. Um, and um, I think, you know, as they've as said, you know, we have to remember that the, the, the definition can only do so much. And uh, so, yeah, I might, I might well throw in my 500 words, but probably that's not for now. All right. I'll try to find uh, your comment and uh, Peter's uh, and then kind of circulate that together with Cole. So I can, can send them to you if you like. Yeah, that will be very helpful, Vivian. Yeah. So, save you searching. <laughs> yeah, and that should be the right one, right, isn't it? Uh, thank you, Mac. It's been already done. All right, Brett, do you want to come in and ask your question, please? Uh, yeah, thanks, Vivian, for a, a very interesting talk. I mean, I, actually, I keep oscillating in my head between two questions, so let's see if I get the chance to ask the other one later. Uh, I'll randomly choose the first one then which is um it's actually inspired by the title of the chapter because it's something i struggled with where i must admit when i first came to lancaster now that's seven years ago now but when i first came to lancaster um i wasn't that familiar with the term network learning mm -hmm. um although i would you know i was very familiar with other terms some of which you deal with in the chapter like cscl 
and I was trying to understand what network learning was, and, and it's exactly the kind of um, question that I went through. And there, are, it seems to me that the difference between theory, practice, practice and pedagogy is partly about the level of granularity at which you're talking. And I think um, the first book I picked up was by David McConnell, uh, the e-learning groups and communities book. And that um, had a very, very definite sort of position. Mm -hmm. And um, to an extent, I, to be honest, it put me off for a while. Um, oh <laughs> and, and so I think you've got this kind of almost two axes being set up. One is the level of granularity at which you're talking, which is, um, you know, something that the chapter covers and has been discussed here. But the other is, um, the other axis, I think, is the level at which you want to be um, specific or prescriptive or um, you know whether you want to include everything or mm -hmm. whether you want to be able to still challenge certain things and where you think the sweet spot is because I think eventually I came to the view that network learning wasn't any of these things theory practice and pedagogy a few years ago I thought of it as a research field and then mm -hmm. I realized well actually that then includes everything and it just becomes a synonym of uh, tell or technology enhanced learning or CSCL. So to what extent do you think network learning needs to retain a definite core set of values that where you can say prescriptively, if you don't adhere to these things, you're just not a network learning researcher? Is it is it a field with boundaries like that, do you think? Yeah, um, prescriptive doesn't sound the right term. Um, because clearly um, that goes against the grain of what network learning um, is trying to work towards. Um, pedagogically, it definitely has a value base. And I think that if people want to research well, actually, most people are researchers and practitioners, so it's not just research. The majority, and certainly the people in um, my own uh, experience of the last 30 years, has been very much running network learning programmes, as well as doing research onto, into the thinking, and the theory, the pedagogy, etc. So I'm losing track of your question now because I was thrown by the prescription part of it. <laughs> um, would you like to repeat? Well, I might, it might throw it again, but it was really about how prescriptive you want the field to be. And be, does it have yeah. certain bits where you can be more or less prescriptive and other bits where you want to be kind of very, very open and, um, and you know, value neutral? I don't, I don't, I mean, nothing is value neutral and no pedagogy is value neutral. So we're stating what our values are and certainly very few of the um, alternatives do that. Um, they take it for granted that the pedagogy that they're using technology for is either obvious or doesn't need to be articulated. Whereas we're saying within network learning, it's important to articulate it and be clear. So in the chapter, for example, we do discuss the different ways community gets used. So there is a flexibility around that. So there's ideas of communities of practice, there's the learning community, there's knowledge communities, but the idea of a community is fairly fundamental in most versions of network learning. So there's flexibility within a bounded um, sort of spectrum and space. And as I said earlier, it, for me, it occupies a given and bounded, um, ultimately pedagogical space which does have its norms and expectations in the same way as any, any other educational space does, but it tries to be explicit about them and tries to be um, 
both reflective and ultimately, um, how can I put it, um, aiming for a more social justice well-being approach. So one of the things it also talks about in the chapter is the two meta discourses of um, education, one uh, being a political ethical discourse and the other a pragmatic economic discourse. It emerges very much within the political ethical discourse and encourages people towards an ethical and integral position in a world that certainly requires that, I would claim. Thank you, Brad, for a question and Vivian. Uh, Dawn, uh, if you don't mind, okay, I'll come back to you. I just wanna give the opportunity to our deeper students here. So, uh, um, so the question has been like kind of swiped by the TEL students, but we do hear that traditional students and deeper student, James, I was, gonna, I was gonna like put you in position anyway, but it's brilliant that you ask great, great question in chat. Um, so the deeper is basically face-to-face -face program. So they have four times residential throughout the year. So it's very different from TEL, but because of pandemic, it went through the online. So you, you can't experience both face-to-face -face and online in deeper, right, James? So do you want to come in um, and ask your question? And if traditional students, mm -hmm. any of here has any question, it will be good to hear from you too. Um, thank you. I suppose my question really is just about whether or not you feel that there's a, a tension and a challenge in network learning as a result of the fact that you know there's widening digital poverty, which has an impact on who our network mm -hmm. learners, I suppose, are, um, as well as the fact that the more that technology advances and the, the more nuanced and specialised that the solutions that we can put in place or develop become, that also adds to that sort of widening digital poverty gap. And I suppose where, where that bottom threshold is that you can, everybody has the opportunity to be involved, but yeah. at the same time, um, that base level of technology isn't inhibiting it being meaningful. And I suppose contributing to that quality that you were talking about before. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's really important. And um, in some respects, that's why I think it's also important to stay with quite uh, low level, robust technologies that can ha be handled by people with lower broadband widths, although they still have to have access to, to broadband to uh, engage with that. But there is a nice chapter actually in the book about uh, who I know, Laura, um, I can never pronounce her name. So she, you know who I mean, such an issue from South Africa, who um, actually has spoken um, to you recently. And I don't know whether she addressed that issue, but she certainly had um, at the last network learning conference, this idea of um, bricks for the uh, rich and clicks for the poor. Um, and it's almost downplaying the potential of being online because um, that is what the poor are being offered, whereas the elite are being still given places in places like Oxford and Cambridge and in um, Briggs. But um, the, the chapter is actually a very nice chapter. And um, one of the things that it clearly identifies and has been identified by other researchers is for a lot of people, the cell phone is sufficient to be able to and use a satellite. So they kind of bypass the computer and go straight into, uh, I mean, there are people clearly on the line who have more experience of this than me. And it'd be interesting to see whether they see this as a really big issue. I'm not denying there's a digital divide, but what I'm trying to advocate is that we don't need to go for really complex and high broadband technology uh, if we want to engage people. And we certainly have a very good um, campus based in Ghana, uh, which we do a lot of uh, network learning type activity with on our um, 
executive MBA. Thank you. Is that the Objectified Cultural Capital yeah. chapter? Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I should have said that instead of trying to pronounce a notion. <laughs> Yeah, that's convivial technology doesn't have to be too fancy so that's always um we have quite related questions in terms of the ethical concerns so phil um i think phil divine asked a question another kind of question related to that so phil do you want to come in and ask your question oh, yeah oh yeah 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 so, so you know um and i'm you know it's kind of like i'm unsure of this question actually or, 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 or relates strongly to the topic but you know, it's, it's like important. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm sort of um, concerned around um, sort of surveillance, like yeah. the, the the um, all sort of mining of um, b b um, b b um, behavioural data for for, yeah. for profit. And um, you you know, can kind of like, um, would you think that that's a threat? To, to network learning um, or um, a, a particularly advantage in potentially kind of like uh, the, the three rebirth of kind of um, kind of um, open source and then um, strengthening of um, pull platforms sort of like like Moodle yeah. um, etc. Yeah, it's a very important question. It has been addressed a lot at network learning conferences um, because clearly there is um, high potential for surveillance um, and increasingly for mining data mm. uh, in terms of where people have been and what they're doing. And as a tutor, it's hard to resist doing that, <laughs> I have to confess. Um, but um, so it definitely is there, uh, and it's definitely something that is spoke about. Um, and I think going back to a network learning position, the stance one would take is basically to be very overt about it and to discuss it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now is a good time for us to re-invite Don. It looks like you're going to be first person to ask question and <laughs> last person to ask question toward the, toward the end of the game. So do you want to come? Thanks. Thanks, Kumi. Um, um, I, I wanted to go back to really to uh, uh, Vivian to the to sort of the question that Brett had in a way, um, which is about this idea of prescriptiveness. Mm. And it seems to me that that prescriptiveness suggests or could could suggest a sort of fix something fixed. Yeah. If you're being prescriptive, you're more fixed. Now, for me, you know, one of the things that you've said about network learning from the outset was this question of, is it, is it a theory? Is it a practice? Is it, a pe is it a pedagogy? It would seem to me that if any of those are fixed, then you have a problem. Because basically, if you can't question those things, mm -hmm. if you can't question your practice, if you can't question your pedagogy, if you can't question theories, then they are no longer those things. Yeah. That basically what you're saying is that there has to be that level of reflexivity and reflectiveness within all of that that that, that accounts for that. So it would it would it would seem to me that that's a for me that's that's a, a fundamental, if you mm -hmm. like, of 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 network learning and something that has tended to attract me towards that as a mm -hmm. concept. And certainly as a as, as a practice, which which would lead to to, to pedagogies and the, and this idea of something not being fixed, but allowing that questioning to move things on, it seems to me to be important. So I guess where I'm where I'm going to with this, Vivian, is the, is the question is this, if 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 any of that makes sense, you know, have you, you've gone back to the definition and you've you've thought about the, the bringing the definition up to date. Where are you with regard to thinking about the theory and the practice and pedagogy? Has that shifted at all? Is yeah. that the thing that should be questioned? And and if so, how? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, in some ways, it's questioned at every network learning conference mm -hmm. to a degree. 
um, because obviously things have changed, new people come into the field, um, theoretical perspectives have developed. So we've gone from one through, I mean, actually um, Martin Dillat and Thomas Ryberg did a, um, an analysis of theoretical perspectives over the years, the 20 years of the Network Learning Conference and how they had changed. And they're much more um, social material and post-digital um, type thinking now from what they were originally. But um, I think for me, there is a certain fixedness, but how they are articulated changes. And I think everything evolves and develops. Um, but one thing I would say is in terms of the consequential learning design that one works with, that can be very, very enormously and still apply the same ideas of theory, pedagogy and practice. The, the actual learning designs are very variable, but I think to work, they have to have a given structure, which is clear to the people who are engaging in those learning designs. So that it's not all fluid and flexible. There is a structure which helps to support what we're trying to do pedagogically. Mm. I'm not sure that really answers the question, but that's what came to mind. <laughs> no, that's that's great. Thanks, Vivian, and 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 a great talk and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining today. I think the conversation will continue because like, then we can probably visit this entire conversation 10 years later and see how we are, where we are. Um, so I just want to uh, finish the session here and there will be other sessions uh, that will be circulate the information later by email. And those particularly who haven't been a part of TEL, uh, the center, and then who joined particularly, I want to thank you guys. And I hope that you find it useful and come back to us if you for if you're uh, eager to have more conversation with us um so and then last words of course is thanks vivian to just make it happen and come for us um and i know that you're retired but that doesn't mean anything because you're academics and then well yeah as i was saying i'm in the middle of writing a paper and i've been <laughs> doing this but i don't do as much yeah, I hope I, I mean, you're going to be around. I hope that we will see you again after everything finish in person. That would be lovely. Yeah, that would so, be good. Yeah, if you I, have, the... I had my retirement due on Zoom. Oh well, let us know where and when it's going to happen. Here. <laughs> um, so if you can just quickly turn on your camera and mic microphone, and then just say thank you to Vivian with your voice and face, <laughs> with smile. That will be great, and we'll see you again. And thank you for all the insightful questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you.